Mm -hmm. Maybe I can also share my screen now. Can you still see my screen? Wonderful. Yeah, I can I can see yep. it. Yep. Yes. So let me get the recording. All right. So then let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. <laughs> um, it's great that you're all here. And in particular, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Jun Sung Park uh, as the speaker of, our, of today's seminar. Uh, Jun is a third year computer science student at uh, the HCI and NLP groups at Stanford, where he's uh, advised by Michael Bernstein and Percy Lyon. And he's been working on natural language processing and machine learning and also LLMs. And today, June will talk about one of his latest works, namely on generative agents. Uh, and we all look very much forward to the presentation. So June, the floor is yours. Take it away. Wonderful. All right. So let me just check that. Hopefully everyone can see my screen again. And great. Yep. Hi everyone. All good. Wonderful. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, again, my name is June. I'm a PhD student here, uh, working with Michael Bronstein and Percy Leon, as Philip mentioned. And today I will talk to you about generative agents, interactive simulacra of human behavior. And this is work I developed with my advisors, Michael and Percy, as well as my mentee, Joey O'Brien, and mentors, Mary Morris and Carrie Kai. For over four decades now, from the time of cognitive architecture and symbolic systems to statistical machine learning, we, the researchers and practitioners at the intersection of HCI and AI, envisioned this ability to simulate believable human behavior, behavior that is so compelling and so human-like that they provide an illusion of life. In our vision, this ability of achieved promised a new class of interactive applications, ranging from model human processors for usability testing to social robots, NPCs, and ubiquitous computing applications that require a rich understanding of our cognition, and even to the foundation of small and large scale social simulations that would test social science and economic theories that are difficult to implement in real life. But despite their wide application spaces, we faced fundamental challenges when simulating human behavior. The space of possibility in the way we behave and communicate, we found, was much too vast and too complex to navigate with existing methods. But I see a new opportunity that is emerging. Generative models, such as large language models that are being trained today, are trained on broad data that reflect our lives, like the traces on our social web, Wikipedia, and more. So as a result of that, these models encode a tremendous amount about us, how we live, talk, and behave. So I posit that with the right method, they can be transformed into the core ingredient that had been missing in the past decades that will enable us to simulate believable human behavior. So today, I will introduce a new way of simulating human behavior in fully general computational agents that can populate an open world like ours while ensuring long-term coherence by fusing a language model with a novel agent architecture that remembers, reflects, and plans based on constantly growing memories and cascading social dynamics. These agents, I'll demonstrate, can not only plan and lead a believable day in life, where they wake up in the morning, do their routines, and go to work as individuals in a sandbox game environment. But they can also come together to give birth to an entirely artificial society of their own, like the one you see here, where each agent will have their own subjective memory and experience, and autonomously spread information, form relationships, and coordinate amongst each other before reflecting on the past days and deciding on how they will live tomorrow. I call these generative agents. And these generative agents, I'm going to suggest, open up a new genre of human AI interaction that is fueled by our newfound ability to simulate believable human behavior. 
So with that, let me demonstrate to you in more detail Smallville. This, this is a setting of our demonstration for generative agents and the mode of agent interaction that takes place in it. So small village is a sandbox game environment that we developed featuring the common affordances of a small village ranging from houses, apartments, cafe, bars, schools, stores, and the sub areas and objects that make the space functional like the bathroom, kitchen, and common room in a family house and a bookshelf and a table in the common room. And we populated the space with 25 agents and initialized each of them with one paragraph of natural language description to detect each agent's identity, including their occupation and relationship with other agents, and seal this paragraph into the agent's memory at the start of the simulation. So that is it. That is all the input we ever give to these agents. And then these agents interact with their environment through their actions based on their own volition. And here's how this works in, in Smallville. So first, the agents generate a natural language statement describing their current action, such as Isabella Rodriguez is drinking coffee. They then translate this into concrete movements that affect the Stenbach game world, along with the automatically generated emojis that visually describe the agent's actions, and they influence the state of the objects in this world. So a bed can be occupied when an agent is sleeping, and a refrigerator can be empty when an agent uses up the ingredients to make breakfast. Then to interact with each, with each other, they determine whether they want to engage in conversations when they see another agent, and they generate natural language dialogue if they decide to engage. So like this dialogue between Isabella and Tom about Sam Moore, who is a fellow agent in Smallville initiated with a memory that he is running for local mayor. So here Isabella remarks, I'm still weighing my options, but I can discuss in the election with Sam Moore, what are your thoughts on him? And Tom responds, to be honest, I don't like Samur. I think he's out of touch with the community and doesn't have our best interest at heart. And importantly, the users can also influence and interact with these agents. So first, much like how agents form dialogues with each other, a user can engage in a dialogue with these agents by specifying a persona that the agents should perceive them as. For instance, if the user specifies that they are a news reporter, and asked about the upcoming election in Smallville, who is running for office, Isabella might reply, Sam. Or to directly command one of the agents, the user can take on the persona of the agent's inner voice, and this makes the agent more likely to treat the statement as a directive. So if the user tells John that he is now running for office while taking on the persona of John's inner voice, John would decide to run in the election and share his candidacy with his wife and son. And second, just as agents can, the user can alter the state of the agent's environment. For instance, if the user sets Isabella's toast on fire, Isabella would rush to put out the fire and remake her toast. And finally, the user can actually control an agent by embodying an agent already present in the world, such as Isabella and John, or join as an outside visitor. Then the inhabitants of Smallville will treat the user-controlled agent no differently than they treat each other. They will recognize its presence, initiate interactions, and remember its behavior before forming opinions about it. And now let me dive in deeper and present you with some vignettes from Smallville that describe their individual as well as collective emergent behavior. So as individuals, generative agents create daily plans that reflect their experiences, execute those plans, react, and replan when appropriate. So here's an example of day in the life of the Lin family. So you see in the map, uh, there's a Lin family in the lower uh, right corner. The Lin family is a family of three. So there's the mother, May, who is a college professor, the father, John, who is a store clerk at the local pharmacy, and the son, Eddie, who is a student at the college who studies music theory. In the Lin family, John is the first to wake up at 6 a.m. He brushes his teeth, takes a shower, and cooks breakfast. And throughout the morning, other family members follow suit, catch up with each other, and by 8 a.m. head to their respective workplaces, May and Eddie to the college and John to the pharmacy. Let's eavesdrop on them a little bit to get a sense of what they talk about. So again, their movements, decision to engage in the dialogue, and the dialogue themselves are all generated. So nothing here is hard-coded. 
So here, John and Eddie are catching up in the morning. John says, good morning, Eddie. And Eddie responds, good morning, Dad. And John asks, what are you working on today? And Eddie responds, I'm working on a new music competition. And only a little after the conversation, May wakes up and joins John. By now, Eddie already left for his classes, but John recalls the conversation he had with his son and finds that to be relevant here. He updates May that Eddie is working on a new music composition for his class, and May responds, oh, that's wonderful. And meanwhile, as a collective, in this practically a small society of generative agents, generative agents exhibit emergent social dynamics where new relationships form, information diffuses, and coordination arises. Let me go over each of these a little bit more in depth. The so first, information diffuses across the Asian community. We've already seen a glimpse of this with the Lin family. Here is another example. We see the Sam with a memory that he's running for local election, and he is telling everyone about it throughout the day. Here, he tells Tom, I'm actually running for mayor in the upcoming local election. And Tom says, really, that's great news. And a few hours later in the game world, John and Tom, who are colleagues at the local store and pharmacy and have independently heard about Sam's candidacy, talk to each other about Sam's chances of winning. So here John says, I heard that Sam Moore is running for mayor. Do you think he has a good chance of winning? And Tom responds, I think he will get a lot of support. Second, new relationships form among the agents in Smallville. So here's an example. Latoya and Sam do not know each other at the start of the simulation, but while taking a walk in Johnson Park, Sam runs into Latoya and they introduce themselves. Latoya tells him that she is at the park to take some photos for a project that she's working on. And the next day, when Sam sees Latoya again, he and Latoya remember each other. This time, Sam asks Latoya, how is your project going. Finally, Asian coordination spontaneously emerged in Smallville. So in our demonstration, we set the starting date to be on February 13th. And with, it, with Isabella, who is the owner of Hop's Cafe, we set an intent to plan a Valentine's Day party from 5 to 7 p.m. on February 14th. From that seat alone, Isabella invites friends and customers to the party spends the afternoon of the 13th decorating the cafe for the occasion and enlists Maria, a friend and a frequent customer at the cafe for help. And meanwhile, Maria asks Klaus, and Klaus is her secret crush here, to go to the party with her. And on the day of Valentine's, the five agents, including Maria and Klaus, actually show up at the Hobbs Cafe at 5 p.m. and they enjoy festivities. So, how do we do this? How do we achieve this Asian behavior? Our main contribution in this work is basically this architecture represented in this figure. This is the architecture of generative agents that powers each of these agents in Smallville. At the center of this architecture is what we call the memory stream. This is the primary database that maintains a comprehensive record of an agent's experience in natural language. From the memory stream, records are retrieved as relevant to the agent's cognitive processes. Let me go over the modules of this architecture in just a little bit more detail. So first is the memory stream and the retrieval function. So here's a challenge that we're trying to overcome with this module. Generative agents in Smallville and likely beyond accrue an extremely large set of records in their memory stream. And fitting the entire memory stream to a language model can distract the model and today, not even a few hours worth of record in Smallville can fit into the limited context window of the state-of-the-art uh, language models, such as GPT-4 and ChatGPT. Our agents, therefore, need a way to store and selectively retrieve portions of their memory. And this is the aim of the memory stream and the retrieval function. So here's a tip of the memory stream of an agent, Isabella. And on the right, you see a few example memory objects in the stream. They contain a piece of memory described in natural language with a creation time timestamp. In particular here, what you're seeing are observational memory of Isabella. And based on this memory stream, our architecture implements a retrieval function that takes the agent's current situation as input. 
and returns a subset of the memory stream to pass on to the language model, which then generates the final alpha behavior of the agent. So in this example, if the situation that Isabella is trying to react to is someone asking, asking, what are you looking forward to the most right now? He would retrieve things that are about the party and formulate a response. I'm looking forward to the Valentine's Day party. Here's how the retrieval function works. So in our architecture, we design this as a combination of the recency, importance, and relevance function for each piece of memory. So basically, we bias towards retrieving memories that are more recent, important, and relevant. So in our work, recency function is implemented as a exponential decay function. The importance function is a prompt that asks the language model for the event saliency. So this is kind of asking the agent how important certain memory pieces are for them. And this is what defines their sort of core memory that they always remember or try to remember. And the relevance function is a cosine similarity measure of the embeddings of the query sentence and the description of a memory. So periodically, going beyond the memories from we just talked about, one of the things that we do is we synthesize clusters of record in the agent's memory stream into higher level abstract thoughts called reflections. And importantly, once they are synthesized, these reflections are just a type of memory. So they are stored in the memory stream, just like observational memories. And the reason why we do this, one of the main challenges we sort of recognize with just memory stream storing observational memory is agents at times have hard time making higher level inferences that try to extract opinions or thoughts from observational memories that they have in the memory stream. So this reflection module is what we're trying to achieve basically here. Um, we're trying to achieve basically this inferences of the agents. And here's sort of the way we do this. So we first generate questions on what to reflect on by looking at 100 most recent records in the agent's memory stream. So if an agent just had lunch, it could be something like, what does the agent like to eat? And then we retrieve records that are relevant to answering those questions, which might be things like, the agent ate an omelet today, yesterday, and the day before yesterday, and we synthesize that into a reflection. Maybe the agent likes to eat omelet. And gradually, over time, what this generates is trees of reflections. The leaf nodes are observations, and the non-leaf nodes are thoughts that become higher level, higher up the tree they are. So here's one for Klaus. So for the context, Klaus is the student researcher who study sociology. So if you look at the bottom, the leaf nodes of this tree, you see observations like Klaus is reading about gentrification, he's reading about urban design, and that gets reflected into a reflection that basically says Klaus Mueller spends many hours reading. Right? And that gets mapped into, along with other observations, higher level reflections, like Klaus Mueller is engaging in research activities and he's dedicated to research. And gradually those reflections get mapped into even higher level thoughts, like he is highly dedicated to research. And the idea here is observation, again, are factual memory of these agents. And we are basically mapping these observations into high level of opinions and thoughts that try to get at some of the more fundamental aspects of the agents or agent surroundings. In this particular instance, what is Klaus dedicated to, which is much higher level than compared to some compared to certainly the factual observations, but even reflections, like he spent many hours reading. Okay. And finally, while a language model can generate plausible behavior in response to situational information, we find that optimizing for believability in the moment can sacrifice believability over time. What we needed was for the agent to plan over a long time horizon. So plans describe a future sequence of actions for the agent and help keep the agent's behavior consistent over time. For instance, for Klaus, who is a student researcher dedicated in his research and has an impending deadline, he will generate plans to spend his day working at his desk, drafting his paper, and so forth. 
In our work, we generate the plans by prompting a language model with a prompt that summarizes the agent and the agent's current status, as you see here for Eddie. So at the top, you, so this is basically a prompt and you basically see agent's summary description. So it has agent's name, some of his innate characteristics and quick description. And at the bottom, it basically has his current status. What is he up to? What is sort of his current broad plan and so forth? And based on this, we generate detailed plans or higher level plans. Now, a main challenge here, however, is controlling for the granularity of the plans generated. In our work, we control for this by taking a top-down approach where we recursively generate more details in the plan. So here's one example. On the left-hand side is Eddie's plan generated in broad strokes that divides his days into roughly seven chunks. So this is sort of a long-term plan uh, that lasts for about a day. We then decompose these chunks first into an hourly schedule and then into five to 15 minute actions that you see on the right-hand side. And once we reach the grand desired granularity in the agent's schedule, they act out their plans in the game world. And what's sort of nice about this recursive setup is you can basically go further in either direction. So you can create even longer plans, longer horizon plans, so you can create basically weekly plans or monthly plans or even something that looks even beyond that. Or you can drill down further and decompose this into minute by minute plans or so forth. Now for our game setup, five to 15 minutes was sort of a kinetic ballpark that we sort of landed on where it gives enough animation that to make this all look compelling. So for our application, that's what we used. Okay. But sometimes the agents may need to change their plans too. Right? So, for instance, if Eddie's father, John, records that he sees Eddie taking a short walk in the house garden, he might decide to start an impromptu conversation. We prompt a language model, as shown here, to make this determination and edit the agent's plans if the situation calls for their responses. So now that I've described to you our agent's behavior and architecture, we can ask, how do we evaluate them? The main dependent variable that we use is believability, which has been a central design and engineering role in a long line of prior literature. So basically, do agents remember, plan, and act, and react, and reflect believably? And to evaluate generative agents' believability, we leverage a methodological opportunity by interviewing it in natural language. In particular, we craft five categories of questions, five questions each, where to respond to these questions properly, the agents must successfully retrieve and synthesize information to stay in character, remember, plan, react, and reflect accurately. So here are some example questions and answers from Klaus's interview. When we asked him to give an introduction of, it, of himself, he properly recalled his name and characteristics. And when we ask him that what he would do when, he, when his breakfast is burning, he tells us that he would quickly turn off the stove and make sure the food doesn't continue burning. Our study procedure was as follows. We test our generative agent architecture as well as ablated architectures and human authors to answer the questions. We then asked 100 human evaluators to rank the answers from different conditions. And then we calculated true skill rating for each condition, which is a generalization of the ELO rating system. Uh, so for any of you who's sort of familiar with how chess rating works, the chess uh, competition often uses ELO rating. So ELO rating is basically a pairwise comparison. It makes a bunch of pairwise com comparison between two players uh, over time and creates sort of a, the skill uh, rating for each players. True skill uh, is basically just like that, but we, because we have five, uh, five conditions, uh, true skill basically relaxes the pairwise condition uh, or that assumption. So it allows us to compare multiplayer games that includes many, many players, right? That goes beyond two players. So this is the reason why we basically use this rating. So we, for each condition, we calculate this competition uh, based at ranks. And this is sort of the finding that we have. Uh, what we find is that the co components of our agent architecture so the observation, plan, and reflection each contribute critically to the believability of agents' behavior. 
So the red bar is the performance of our full agent architecture, and it significantly outperforms every other conditions, including the human author conditions. It's also worth noting that when compared to the condition representing prior work, so when I say prior work, uh, recently there's been a lot of work uh, that tried to sort of recently as in like the past six months or so, uh, there's been some work uh, that tried to basically replicate side experiments. And I also talk about one work uh, called Social System Electra, which was precursor to generative agents that tried to basically use prompting to generate human behavior that's cross-sectional. So in this moment, how would a certain person behave in this uh, for this particular context? Uh, so that's what I mean by prior literature. Basically, that's the no reflection plan observation, no architectural condition uh, of our study. And what's and then we finally included the human author condition. So the human author condition is basically asking crowd workers to role play as these agents. And what we find is that the red, the full architectural condition outperforms every other condition. And what's also worth noting is that when compared to the condition representing prior work, again, there are no reflection plan and observation, our full generative agent architecture produces a standardized effect size of coins D equal to 8.16. Or another way of saying this is that eight standard deviation improvement compared to the prior work. So that's a quite significant uh, boost compared to prior work. And of course, I will note here that this did not mean that our agents with, were without flaws. They would sometimes fail to retrieve certain memories. Like when Rajiv answered, I haven't been following the election too closely, even though he talked to Sam to hear about his candidacy. And they would sometimes embellish their memory too. For instance, Isabella was aware of Sam's candidacy in the election, and he, he confirmed this when she asked, when she, when she was asked, but she also added that he's going to make an announcement tomorrow, even though Sam had mentioned no such plan. Okay. Additionally, we conducted an end-to-end -end evaluation of the agents to better understand the types of emergent behavior we observe among generative agents. First, we find that agents shared and remembered information. So seven heard about Sam's candidacy and 12 agents heard about the Valentine's Day party. You can actually see the path the party invitation took across the Asian community on the right here. So you see Isabella sharing this information that she's planning to have this party. She shares it to Giorgio, Eddie, Sam, and so forth. And these agents then further spread this information to others. So Sam, for instance, shared this information to his wife, uh, Jennifer. He tells Jennifer, speaking of which, Isabella has invited us to the party, and so forth. Second, we find that the agents remembered and joined the Valentine's Day party. In particular, five agents came to the party. Of the ones who didn't make it, three-sided conflicts, like Rajiv and a painter, who explained that he was too busy. And four showed interest in the party, but still did not show up. Now, this does make things a little bit difficult to evaluate, though. On the one hand, we might view this as an error. They couldn't retrieve memory that they should have been able to retrieve. But on the other hand, this is extremely realistic human behavior in my experience. But of course, there were boundaries and errors in our agent behavior. One that is particularly noteworthy here is that the instruction tuning of the language model seems to guide the behavior of the agents to be overly polite and cooperative. Even when talking to her family, for instance, they always greeted them formally. And Isabella never really refused ideas to include in her party even when the ideas did not exactly align with her identity. So that's generative agents. And it's been something a bit of an unusual past few weeks where we seem to have gotten more interest about this work than we sort of had realized uh, when we first put out an archive. And I think some of, some of the things that we've been learning is there's a lot of application spaces that people are really excited about in terms of generative agents. And I think that's sort of one of the main reasons why it has gotten the interest that it has gotten in the past few weeks. And I sort of tried to demonstrate one of those application areas that I and my team find to be particularly exciting. Um, and this is called social simulacra. And as I sort of uh, briefly mentioned in a few slides back, this is actually work that uh, predates uh, generative agents. So we actually built this first. 
And as you see here, the philosophy is very much the same. We're generating human behavior. Now back with, with social simulacra, we didn't have this complex architecture and so forth, but we are leveraging a large language model to generate human behavior. Again, this is more cross-sectional, but the hope is that this will sort of demonstrate that this is something that can be augmented with generative agents architecture in the future. And this is something that can augment our capacity for using building different applications that's grounded in our ability to simulate human behavior. Okay. So this is, again, work that I developed with my advisors, Michael and Percy, as well as my mentee uh, for this project, Lindsay Popolsky, and mentors, Mary Morris and Carrie Kai. So for many decades now, we have designed and deployed countless social computing systems. But the irony is, even today, as more and more people populate these systems, we continue to get surprised by the things that happen in them, like unexpected trolling or subtle antisocial behaviors, all the way to cases such as people congregating to spread hate speech and, and misinformation. But why is this? Because in theory, this issue of understanding how people might use an interactive system is something that we know how to tackle. That's what prototypes like the ones you see here are all about. But here's a challenge. In my vision, a successful social computing prototype needs to prototype not, for instance, the user flow of how one might click around different pages, but the social dynamics that might arise when the system reaches critical mass of users, because that's where the uncertainty is in social systems. And that is an impossible task for our existing prototyping approaches. Where are we going to get thousands or even tens of thousands of diverse test users? How would we protect the social dynamics that might arise without releasing these designs to a large number of people? Generative agents enable a new way of protecting a social computing system that tackles this challenge by generating a large number of synthetic social interactions that might arise in a populated social system. And that's, all, that's what we call social simulacra. Social simulacra is an approach. So this is an approach for leveraging the richness and the generative capacity of models such as a large language model to populate a social computing system with generative agents and behaviors for the purpose of prototyping the system design. And we will demonstrate this approach in practice by implementing it as a web application tool for prototyping subreddits that takes community design, such as the goals, rules, and moderation strategies, and translates them to a generated community like the one you see here that has never existed before to illustrate the good, the bad, and the ugly of the interactions that a community governed by these designs may harbor. Now, let me show you what it can do. So our two has three core features, generate, what if, and multiverse, and they each answer to the core needs in social computing design. So first, generate. Prior literature suggests that social computing designers struggle to envision the breadth of interactions that their design might facilitate. Generate helps the designers by populating a subreddit community with generated users, top level posts, and replies to those posts to help them envision the space. So it takes from the designer a range of design specifications, such as the goals, rules, and member compositions, and returns a subreddit-like page that is fully populated, like the, what, uh, like the one you see here on the right-hand side. So here's an example. So in these slides, everything on the left is the designer's input, and everything on the right is social simulacra's output. So in a community for connecting people moving to Los Angeles with locals, Social Simulacra generated a new user, Leon Santos, who posted, I'm new to LA, what are some of the best places to visit on a weekend? And in response, our tool generated Lucas Jameson, who replied, I would recommend visiting the Getty Center, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and going hiking. And here's another one. This time in a community for people interested in learning about personal finance, Social Simulacra generated Dane Wood, who posted, I spent 21K to go to college ended, and ended up with 23K in debt. But in response, in response this time, R2 generated Elizabeth Neal, who is a troll. Here she said, that's a lot of debt, man. I haven't seen that much since I shopped at Macy's during the holiday season. 
The second feature, what if, aims to give the designers more interactive control over social simulacra to help them explore how individual conversations might be influenced. So what if takes from the designer an existing Reddit conversation and regenerates it from the middle of it, as you can see here. So imagine Maya Smith posted to a forum for WIST authors. She said, I've been working on my WIST paper for a few weeks and I'm feeling really stuck. And to this Heather Hernandez, who is an HCA professor, replied with a short advice, it's no more to feel stuck when writing a paper, good luck. But as a designer, you might want to know so you can prepare for it, what if instead of Heather, a troll replied? Or what about an advertiser? The what if feature answers to that precise need. So here, instead of Heather, a troll replied, you're just not cut out for this kind of research. Whereas here, an advertiser replied with click the link below to learn more. Equipped with this, the designer can now even ask, what could the moderator say in response to this undesirable behavior? And if the moderator intervened with no advertisement placed to the advertiser, what are some of the ways the conversation could have developed from that point on? The final feature here is multiverse. And this is the feature that makes the model uncertainty explicit. With the first two features, generate and what if, what I've shown you is our tool's capacity for generating realistic content. But human behavior is inherently complex. And no matter how likely something is to happen, there's no guarantee that it will happen. And this is an important conceptual scaffold for social simulacra. So instead of just showing the designer one possible outcome, multiverse augments the previous two features, simulate and what if, by explicitly showing many possible ways the interaction can unfold from one initial state. This encourages the designer to explore the design space with inductive insights, rather than over relying on the one prediction made by the model. So how are social so are social simulacra successful in what they are meant to achieve? And what does success here look like? So our success here basically is, can social simulacra help the designer create new subreddits and actually meaningfully prototype the space so that they can iterate on its design? So we ran a designer evaluation where we recruited 16 participants who had experience designing social spaces and asked them to design a new subreddit with the help of social simulacra. What we find is that today, without social simulacra, the design practices for social computing systems are reactive. The so participant aid's comment here is particularly salient, which says, basically all the rules are set in reaction to the dumpster fire. And our participants saw this as the reason why social simulacra could be really valuable because it would offer them a sense of security if they could try different iterations of established norms before actually releasing their design. We also find that social simulacra offer concrete design insights to our participants. Among them are finding unexpected model citizen behaviors, like impromptu friends seeking to go sizing in a community for sharing fun events around Pittsburgh, and finding unexpected undesirable behaviors like troll farms, shifting the tone of a discussion community. So that's social simulacra. And we sort of find this to be one application space uh, where generative agents could be used for. But I think this, the application space of this technique more broadly is quite, uh, quite interesting and a rich area to pr uh, pursue in the future. So with that, I will thank my advisors and collaborators and funders one more time. And thank you all for inviting me here and listening. OK, great. Thanks a lot for this very nice uh, presentation. Um, let me quickly stop the, uh, the stream and the recording, and then we can go 